So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this is a terrific program that we have. I've been looking forward to this program. It involves uh, friends of mine who have uh, been involved in journalism and in politics and public policy. And I know we're going to have a really good discussion tonight. Before I even introduce uh, Randall Pinkston uh, or Robbie Luckett, I want to introduce a lifelong friend of mine, Gene Luckett, who is here. <laughs> and a lot of you know Gene. Gene and I went to Provine together. I know you think I'm 10 years older than her, but we still were at Provine together. <laughs> <laughs> and she was editor of our high school newspaper, The Rambler, two years before I was. So everything I know, I learned from Gene. <laughs> and, and we're so glad that you could join us tonight, Gene. So Randall Pinkston is a senior fellow at the Overby Center and a professional in residence here at the journalism school. And he and I have been talking about a program tonight. And Randall's got such an interesting background that I knew whatever we did was going to be good. <laughs> he grew up in, uh, well, he didn't grow up, he was born in Yazoo County. And then he moved to, as all smart thinking people did back then, to Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, he uh, graduated from Lanier High School. And he went to Millsaps and graduated from Millsaps College. And he wanted, thought he wanted to be a lawyer and got his law degree from the University of Connecticut. But he came home and uh, worked for WLBT, uh, Channel 3 in Jackson. And he was the first full-time African-American anchor at WLBT and in Jackson. And times were changing back then. And Randall was on the cutting edge of that change. And uh, he uh, stayed in Jackson. They, they weren't uh, big. I knew this from working at the Jackson Daily News. Gene was at the Clarence Ledger uh, and at WLBT. They weren't big on giving raises back then. <laughs> You know, I doubt they're big on giving raises even today. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Randall said, well, I can do better than this. And he went off to seek his fortune. And he uh, had a long and distinguished career at CBS News. And, you know, he did just about all of it at uh, CBS. And he's a familiar face to a lot of you and to people all around the country. He had assignments all over the world. He... Uh, filled in as anchor, and he was on all the major CBS newscasts and really uh, made a name and a reputation for himself there at CBS. Um, I uh, first admired him for what he did at WLBT, and a woman named Kay Mills wrote a book about uh, when WLBT lost its license because of its overt racist policies. And Randall had already been hired before they uh, lost their license uh, because they were trying to mend their ways. They had a lot of ways to mend for. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, I read this book 20 years ago, a long time ago. And I asked, I'd forgotten it. And I asked Randall, was he in it? And he said, yeah, I'm in it. <laughs> and he said, it's up there on my bookshelf. Uh, and so I got it and I turned to page one. And he's on page one. Very first, <laughs> he, he's the very first person that she uh, mentions. And so she uh, references Randall. He was called Willie back then. References Willie Pinkston and his friends gathering around the television set on Saturday afternoons to watch Teen Tempos, which at that time was white teenagers dancing. And they would laugh at those white teenagers <laughs> dancing. And I was on Team Tempos, and I think you were laughing at me dancing. <laughs> I can't dance either. <laughs> and if you saw me dance today, you'd still be laughing. <laughs> so Randall and I go way back, back further than we realized. But there was something that Kay Mills wrote early in the book to kind of set the stage for her entire book. They made reference to Randall. I wanted to read this. Uh, she said, this book tells the story of people like Willie Pinkston, 
whose life was changed by the challenge to WLBT's license. And it shows how news coverage by a reconstituted WLBT helped alter the racial and political dialogue in Mississippi and throughout America. Well, Randall has been doing that all his life. And he has done that this semester. He's been terrific with the students, bringing in uh, really big names, people of uh, major reputation to uh, help them see the bigger world. And tonight, uh, he's gonna help us uh, look at what I think is one of the most controversial, possibly unnecessarily controversial topics that we have had. And what better place than a center for journalism and politics to talk about critical race theory. And so Randall's gonna bring some special insights with his uh, guest here tonight in a way that uh, perhaps allow us to look at this in a way that we have not before. We pride ourselves here on being a place of civilized, informed discussion. And I know Randall is gonna lead us into that. Randall, we're so glad that you've chosen to spend this semester with us at Ole Miss. And thank you for moderating and guiding this program tonight. Randall Pinkston. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Overby, for those kind words, your introduction, and for inviting me to be an Overby Fellow. I consider it an honor and a privilege to join the outstanding alumni of fellows who have had the opportunity to contribute to the marketplace of ideas here in our home state. Now, as some of you know, um, and he asked me not to talk about him, but I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Overby led the team at the Clarion Ledger that won a Pulitzer Prize for its reporting on public education in Mississippi. Now at that time, and some would argue still today, Mississippi was rated last in educational metrics as compared to other states in the United States. The reporting that Charles directed helped to lead to the passage of historic education reform laws in the administration of Governor William Winter. So in part, because of his long-standing interest in education in Mississippi, Charles readily gave me the green light to explore how this controversial topic, the proposed anti-critical race theory legislation, would impact the teaching of Mississippi civil rights history. In other states, anti-CRT legislation has been aimed at banning certain books and curricula, such as the 1619 Project, and so I was wondering if Mississippi's anti-CRT legislation might restrict the teaching of our K through 12 Mississippi Civil Rights Curriculum that was promoted so many years ago by uh, another Republican governor named Haley Barber, who by the way is from Yazoo City. Um, not that that is necessarily apropos of anything, but I just thought I would mention it. Since he says to everybody, I'm not from Yazoo City, I'm from Yazoo County, which is true. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> The organization that took the lead in proposing anti-CRT legislation, drafting the bill even that was introduced initially in the state Senate, is the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. Now, I invited the president of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, the CEO, Douglas Carswell, to join us here tonight um, to discuss this issue. I sent several emails, made phone calls, spoke to one of his staff members, a Miss Annika Page, kindly requesting a response to my invitation. I heard nothing until this past Saturday morning when I received a press release from Mr. Carswell celebrating what he described as a big win against critical race theory in Mississippi. Here is an excerpt from that press release, quote, Dear friend, we won, almost. Our critical race theory bill is now one governor's signature away from becoming law. In October, the Mississippi Center for Public Policy published a report on critical race theory in our state. Our report showed that this extremist ideology is being promoted and contained model legislation to deal with it. Our bill has now been voted through both the Senate and the House by large majorities. This is a big win for common sense in our state. It also is a crushing defeat for a number of left-wing journalist activists in Mississippi who ran a campaign of misinformation 
against the bill. Contrary to what some extreme progressive journalists claimed, our bill does not prevent the teaching of history, nor does it stop teachers teaching about the civil rights movement. Our bill is 100% consistent with Dr. Martin Luther King's vision of an America in which people are judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. The days when a small handful of progressive activists masquerading as journalists can create false narratives about our state are coming to an end. We have shown how we can win. And at the end of that press release, he added a PS. Spring has sprung, so I have decided to take my chances in the yard, or garden as we say in England. I have begun planting, and this is the view this weekend from my vegetable patch, and he showed a picture. Um, Mr. Carswell, who is from England, and pardon me for trying to approach an English accent, um, He's also a former member of parliament. Now, he never rejected my invitation, and he never responded. But he's not here. So we will not have the benefit of his in-person input to our discussion about this issue, the alleged dangers of critical race theory that his organization amplified, leading to the legislation that is indeed one step from becoming law with Governor Tate Reed's signature. We should note a curious facet of this hotly contested legislation is that is, by the way, opposed by every African American in the House and Senate and a handful of white lawmakers as well. Now, while the legislation is labeled anti-CRT, there's no mention of critical race theory within the body of the proposed law. And let me read some of what's inside the body of the proposed law. And I had hoped that Mr. Carswell would be here to talk about this, but since he isn't, due diligence, it says, no university, community college, or public school shall direct or compel students to affirm that any sex, race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin is inherently superior to any other. That individual students are not to be adversely treated due to their sex, race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin, and provides that no distinctions or classifications are to be made on account of race other than that which is required for collection of reporting of demographics. And there's also a provision that the Department of Education, the Mississippi Department of Education, would be prohibited from releasing funding to entities under its jurisdiction, including school districts, charter schools, community colleges, universities, colleges, boards of trustees, and the Mississippi Community College Board for any violations of the act. Now, I grew up in Mississippi. I attended public schools, first grade at Hall Elementary, a five-room house in the middle of a cow patch there in uh, Yazoo County near the old Potosi store, second through 12th grades in Jackson, Smith Robertson, Royanna Lanier. And I know for a fact that the Mississippi History textbook, the cover of which you see on the screen, Mississippi History, the one authored by historian John K. Bettesworth, definitely described one race as superior. And guess which race that was? <laughs> in her paper, The Evolution of Race in Mississippi History Textbooks from 1900 to 1995, Dr. Rebecca Davis gave this description of the textbooks, including Dr. Bettesworth's, that were used in the public schools before and after my generation, quoting Dr. Davis here. Many school boards in the Deep South consistently selected textbooks that defended outdated ideas regarding slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, and civil rights. As a result, Southern school children remained firmly rooted in a past that mythologized the Old South and lost cause and ignored African Americans. In 1980, the U.S. District Court ruled that Mississippi students deserved another version of history and approved the revisionist history textbook, Mississippi, Conflict and Change, by James W. Lowen and Charles Salas. And one of the researchers on that book is present with us here tonight, uh, Dr. Jean Middleton Hairston. Um, reading on about Dr., uh, from Dr. Davis's quote, until then, the adopted textbooks shielded Mississippi students from the realities of their past, providing a whitewashed narrative that degraded African Americans and championed many of the wrong causes and heroes. And that's from her paper, The Three R's, Reading, Writing, and Race, The Evolution of Race in Mississippi History Textbooks. The late James Lowen, the co-author of Conflict and Change, wrote this about Bettersworth, 
First, he quotes from a paragraph that Bettesworth wrote about Reconstruction. Now, this is what Dr. Bettesworth said. Yet by 1875, the old political order had returned, and white and black people set about the task of getting along together in the New South as they had in the old. And this is from Dr. Lowen's paper, How Two Historians Responded to Racism in Mississippi. Now, this is what Lowen had to say about Bettesworth's statement. The final sentence is accurate if understood ironically. By 1876, Bettesworth misstates, the old political order had indeed returned. From then until the civil rights movement began to cause improvement, whites and blacks indeed did get along as they had in the old South, that is, hierarchically, with whites on top, blacks on the bottom. Bettesworth's own white supremacy distorted not only his treatment of Reconstruction, Throughout, his book simply omits African Americans whenever they did anything notable. Among its 60 images of people, for example, just two included African Americans, and both were Old South images. A drawing of a white mistress reading from the Bible to a group of slaves, and a painting of cotton pickers by a white artist. Again, how two historians responded to racism in the Mississippi, James Lauren History News Network uh, of George Washington University. This is the book that people in my generation used to learn about Mississippi history, black kids and white kids. For the white kids, it was like all fine because, you know, it was all fine. For us, there was nothing redeeming about it, nothing about the... Uh, the accomplishments, the many accomplishments that uh, black Mississippians had made, not to mention the uh, difficulties that we had suffered under this system of segregation. Well, it should be clear to all of you by now that I do have a point of view on this subject. <laughs> but I think we'll get a better informed point of view from our esteemed guest, Dr. Robert Luckett. He grew up in Jackson earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Yale University, a PhD in history from the University of Georgia. His research interests are modern civil rights movements, the African, uh, African American history, and American history. His professional memberships include the Association of African American Museums, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the American Historical Society, uh, Association, the Southern Historical Association, and the Mississippi Historical Society. He has contributed chapters to a number of books and is the author of Joe T. Patterson and the White South's Dilemma, Evolving Resistance to Black Advancement. Dr. Luckett is a professor of history and director of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University, and he is also a member of the Board of Trustees for the Jackson Public School District. I've asked Dr. Luckett to give us a primer on the legislation requiring the teaching of Mississippi civil rights history, K through 12, already on the books since the days of Republican Governor Haley Barber. After his presentation, we will magically hear from Mr. Carswell. Dr. Luckett. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Pinkston. It's my uh, great uh, privilege and honor to be here. Thank you, Mr. Overby. Uh, also, thank you for introducing my mother, Jean. I'm glad her good reputation precedes me wherever I go. Uh, <laughs> I brought my my own cheer squad uh, here on the front row. Uh, and also, um, our my great good friend and colleague, Dr. Jean Middleton Harrison, who was one of the contributors to Mississippi Conflict and Change, and who I have the great pleasure of serving on the school board of Jackson Public Schools with um, today. So let me preface this conversation by saying there are three people who I deeply admire and respect, who I want to lift up and honor, and who would be much better suited, um, perhaps, to answer this question about uh, the civil rights curriculum that we have currently in Mississippi and how it came about, at least two of whom most of you probably know quite well. The first is my great friend and, and hero, Susan Glisson, um, and the work she did through the then William Winter Institute 
to make this happen. And if anyone and any organization deserves credit for the civil rights curriculum we have in Mississippi today, it's Susan and it's the, the Winter Institute today, the Alluvial Collective. The other is one of her uh, uh, mentees, who is also a good friend of mine and today the executive director of the Alluvial Collective, which the Winter Institute has evolved into, and that's Mr. Vaughn Gordon. And I'm guessing many of you know Vaughn or have met Vaughn and spent time with him and know what a remarkable human being he is. He gave a talk this past week in Jackson for a legislative breakfast with Mississippi Today. And let me say, the reporting that has been happening around this issue through Mississippi Today has been absolutely excellent, including stories about what's been going on on this campus, your critical race theory class in the law school, um, the statements that have been issued by your student body and your faculty. Um, they have been doing excellent work. And I, I, I've known Vaughn a long time. And um, I had the pleasure of sitting through the, his conversation. So I told him that I would, as a historian, I was going to cite him, but also plagiarize him at the same time. So um, I, I took a, I cribbed a lot of notes while, while he was talking. And the, the third is Chauncey Spears, who now works for Vaughn at the Alluvial Collective and at the time was at the Mississippi Department of Education. Um, when I came to Jackson State in 2009, this had already been in the works for several years, so I wasn't there for the outset of it, but these three people really were, and were the boots on the ground kind of making it happen. Now, the, the social studies curriculum that we have K-12 and the civil rights plank of it, the strand as they call, call it, really came out of conversations after the 2005 conviction of Edgar Ray Killen. Preacher Killen, the infamous Klansman, who was finally convicted in 2005 of the Freedom Summer, summer murders of uh, Andrew Goodman, Mickey Schwerner, and James Cheney uh, outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi, for his complicity uh, in that um, 41 years later. Um, and, and from that came these conversations and the establishment of a Civil Rights Commission in Mississippi at the time, and the desire to have... Um, civil rights taught in our schools, kindergarten uh, through 12th grade. And absolutely, Governor Haley Barber supported this. Um, there are some questions as to what his motivations were for supporting at the time, and I think that's fair to be uh, honest about at the time when he was considering a run for the presidency, but nonetheless, he did. And without his support, it wouldn't have happened. But the curriculum, as it was written and as it was put into law, um, has kind of a, a, a twofold story, both a, a, a kind of a double-edged sword, a good side and kind of a bad side to it, um, if you would. Um, one, the fact that it exists is great, but the legislation that created it, uh, and, uh, and I talked to Susan yesterday um, at length about this, Susan, listen, um, the legislation that created it the Witter Institute had pushed for legislation that stated the Mississippi Department of Education shall provide for the teaching of a civil rights curriculum. That's, uh, I'm paraphrasing, that's uh, essentially what they had proposed for the legislation. What it actually says and what was actually passed into law and is still law to this day is that the Mississippi Department of Education may provide for the teaching okay. of civil rights education of this civil rights curriculum. The distinction between may and shall is a big one. Um, to this day, it is not state law that anyone has to teach this. Mm. It is just may. And this is actually an old trick of the state legislature. Um, I believe in 1960 or 61, the Mississippi Constitution of, uh, of 1890 calls for free public education for all children in Mississippi. Now, at the time in 1890, it called for segregated education, separate schools for white students and black students. And that part of the Constitution, when it was drafted in 1890, it said the state of Mississippi shall provide a free education for all children, white students and black students, or colored, as it said in the Constitution at the time. 1960-61, in the midst of the threat of Brown versus Board of Education and desegregation, the state of Mississippi revised the state Constitution and changed that word shall to may. And that was an intentional segregationist attempt to be able to allow school districts to close their schools altogether rather than desegregate. If you may have to do it, that's one thing, but if you shall do it, it's another. 
So this uh, intentional use of the word may in, in 2005 when it became law was disappointing to the people who were trying to push it. Nonetheless, there's got to be some reason for celebrating that it exists. <laughs> and uh, I will say, uh, and this is a perspective that has changed over time, particularly since joining the school board in Jackson, I actually believe that the people who are um, at the Mississippi Department of Education are generally people of goodwill, uh, and they want to do what's best um, by our students. Sometimes they they don't do such a great job. Other times um, they really do. But I think in general, they want to do best by our students. And so when the law passed, they rewrote the social studies framework, kindergarten through 12th grade. You can go look at it. The current framework that we use in social studies is uh, essentially the same. It was readopted, amended in 2018. And you may have heard the news that the Mississippi Department of Education had a hearing in Jackson several weeks ago that's considering further um, uh, for, further edits uh, to the curriculum and changing the curriculum more, primarily in response to this potential CRT uh, ban, which, I, by the way, I would just say, uh, thankfully, we're doing this tonight because per Mr. Carswell, once the governor signs this thing, we'd all be breaking the law, right? Like here, having this public conversation right now. Um, so um, uh, going back to the curriculum, though, the the MDE social studies curriculum of 2018 is incredibly well written. And you can find it, you can download it, you can just Google it, download a PDF, you can read through it. It includes five strands um, in, in the social studies curriculum. Um, those strands, let's see if I can remember them all, uh, include civics, economics, geography, um, history, and civil rights. Those are the five strands that are part of our social studies curriculum in Mississippi that, again, began after this law was passed uh, in, um, uh, in 2005. Um, if you go through and you look at the curriculum, it, it is really well developed. Even for our youngest children, we can have conversations about things like, what does it mean to have rights, right? What does, you know, equality mean? What does, um, you know... What does good citizenship look like? And you can go through the curriculum and you can read it at length and, and, and see that you know, it's, it's fairly innocuous, first of all, <laughs> you can imagine, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade, but there is a civil rights strand embedded there. Now, two problems. With it embedded there, but the law saying that the MDA, MDE may provide for this but not shall, there's no real enforcement of whether or not that civil rights strand is taught statewide. And so we have real disparity in the implementation of how the civil rights strand is taught statewide. It varies drastically from place to place and often depends on parents, administrators, and teachers demanding that it, that it be included and that these conversations uh, around civil rights be included. The other thing is that within the context that we live in, I think we all understand the centrality of testing in our schools. No matter what you think about it, and, and I, for one, do not believe that standardized testing is a strong indicator of anybody's capacity to succeed in the world. Nonetheless, it is the law, and it is something that we have to do in our schools, right? We, we have to teach these, um, we have to teach and, and administer these exams to see, um, to be measured about whether or not our students have mastered the content. The strand, the civil rights strand, is not a high priority in the testing. In fact, if you go to the junior U.S. history curriculum and you look at the strand for specific, the, the U.S. history curriculum your junior year is modern U.S. history. So it's 1877 roughly to the present, What kind of where we defied it um, in the academic world uh, as well, usually. Um, if you go look at that civil, the strand for, for the civil rights movement specifically, there are six questions that you're expected to be able to answer at the end of the year as part of that strand in your U.S. history class that are related to the civil rights movement. The questions are incredibly broad, relatively vague, and if you're a civil rights scholar and, and know enough about the movement, you would 
probably take issue with some of the way these things are, 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 are framed. You do not have to get any of those questions correct in order to pass the exam. You don't, you don't actually have to answer any question about the civil rights movement in Mississippi or the United States in order to pass the end of the year exam for 11th grade US history. Um, so we have this law that says we may offer this curriculum. I believe the people at the Mississippi Department of Education, including at the time Chauncey Spears, were really intentional about trying to make that curriculum as strong as possible. But without good testing and without a law saying we shall require it, there's essentially inconsistent enforcement of it across the state. And so there are some places where it's a great success. There are some places where it's non-existent. And we certainly have a long ways to go. And I will say through none of that curriculum uh, in, in anywhere in the social studies framework, you can go look at it, is something like critical race theory even conceptualized as something we're teaching kindergarten through 12th grade. Thank you very much, Dr. Luckett. And that was going to be my next question. Is there any teaching of CRT in Mississippi public schools as far as you know? I've, I've never heard of it. I've been on the school board now since 2017 in Jackson. Uh, critical race theory is an academic concept, which I know we're going to talk s uh, some more about, about what it actually is versus what the misconceptions are, it is, is a topic that's taught in our colleges and universities, potentially, it's very specifically in one class at the University of Mississippi, right? Uh, and if you could see the great reporting by Mississippi Today and the uh, excellent story that they wrote uh, about that class uh, in particular. Um, I, I don't encounter it. I've never encountered it in Jackson Public Schools as a concept being taught, and I've, I don't know anyone who is teaching it kindergarten through 12th grade. In Mr. Carswell's absence, I thought you might like to know a little bit about him and his organization. Douglas Carswell is the president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, which describes itself as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that advocates low taxes, light regulation, and limited government. Its initiatives have included a universal occupational licensing bill passed into law, the Mississippi Fat Cat Report, which changed the narrative of the state over taxation, a report on critical race theory, the topic of our discussion tonight, which led directly to the introduction of legislation on the verge of becoming a law, and they have also popularized the campaign to abolish Mississippi state income tax. The 12 member board of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy includes three women, but from the pictures that I observed, no people of color. The center through its Mississippi Justice Institute has been involved in a number of successful litigations and legislative initiatives. In January 2021, Carswell joined the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. Previously, he was a member of the Conservative Party and Parliament in the United Kingdom for 12 years. He was a co-founder of Vote Leave. Vote Leave was the campaign that resulted in the United Kingdom leaving the um, European Union. Brexit is what it's called, exiting from that, and there's been all kind of issues flowing from that decision. Carswell said he came to the U.S. because he believes freedom in this country is under attack from a radical new left. One of his concerns is critical race theory. He was interviewed last October by Paul Gallo as Carswell and his organization was promoting the passage of anti-CRT legislation in Mississippi. Here is Mr. Carswell being interviewed. Well, we need to talk about CRT because it's not getting any better at all. I noticed that uh, Terry McAuliffe, McAuliffe is like a bad penny. He never goes away. He has been around for so long. And, of course, he's running for governor of Virginia. And uh, West, is it West Virginia? I think it's West, is it West Virginia? No, it's Virginia. It is Virginia. And he says absolutely positively that there's no CRT in the state of Virginia. And I've heard people say there's none in our state. As a matter of fact, I had the uh, superintendent of education on, Dr. Carolyn Wright, and she says she doesn't know of any that's taught in Mississippi schools. 
you've just issued a research paper combating critical race theory in Mississippi. What do you say about that? We actually quote her interview with you in our paper. Mm -hmm. The education establishment, not just in Mississippi, but throughout America, quite often says critical race theory. Of course, we don't do that. So what we've done in this report is actually look beyond the label. What does critical race theory actually mean? What sort of ideas constitute this theory? And what we've discovered here in Mississippi is undoubtedly that critical race theory is being taught. For example, the Department of Education... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it, and we've got plenty of time to do this uh, after the break here. This is a short segment. But is it being taught under a, curribul- a, a curriculum with a title that spells that out? Or is it being hijacked by some teachers... Teaching it under different labels very, just because as a public, uh, or rather as something that's personally uh, close to them. Those teaching critical race theory very seldom admit to teaching critical race theory. Mm-hmm. First of all, because it's a, a label used by those of us who are against these divisive and extremist ideas. So rather than take at face value an admission as to whether or not critical race theory is being taught, you need to ask, are these ideas behind it? being taught? Is the notion that America is an inherently racist country being taught? Are people being taught that there is, that the behaviors and outlooks are defined by your racial identity? There are a whole series of, of ideas that lie behind critical race theory. And what we've discovered is that despite these denials, the Department of Education in Mississippi itself recommends that teachers use as a professional development tool resources that are explicitly promoting critical race theory. For example, today is Columbus Day. Yeah. Why is it that a Department of Education here in Mississippi recommends Mississippi teachers use as a teaching resource a resource provided by the Zinn Education Project, which explicitly is campaigning for the abolition of Columbus Day? In fact, it talks about Christopher Columbus Day as being a shameful day. Why is it that Mississippi Department of Education explicitly recommends teachers use these resources? It's not enough to just say this isn't being done. I think that, take a step back, Martin Luther King helped to define America. That extraordinary speech he gave where he talked about America becoming a country where people were judged on the content of the character, not on the color of their skin. This dangerous dogma threatens to destroy and endanger that legacy of what it means to be an American. And if we're not careful, without people being aware of it, we will see this extremist Marxist ideology being promoted. Let let me go back to the Zen, that spells Z-I-N-N, the Zen Education Project. Go into that a little bit more. What what is that? Is that a curriculum that teaches? Is that the basis of the history uh, curriculum? Howard Zen was the author of an extremist book that entered the mainstream of the education establishment, a people's history of the United States. And it basically argued that the American idea is flawed, America is a racist country, and America is built on hatred and exploitation. It, it couldn't be more wrong. And unsurprisingly, some progressive teachers created something called the Zinn Education Project to promote these ideas and to try to ensure that children are indoctrinated with these disastrous and uh, obnoxious beliefs. So, so why is the Mississippi Department of Education explicitly recommending that teachers, as part of their professional development, use this resource? Uh, there are other resources that they use, but this is just one of them. It's, it's not enough to say we don't do critical race theory. Her own department is recommending teachers lock into these ideas and bring these ideas into Mississippi classrooms. Mm-hmm. That can't be right. The curriculum itself has evidence of progressive bias. Now, there are some bits in the curriculum that are are, are very fair and I would say very balanced, but not all of it. For example, the curriculum (laughs) recommends that teachers teach young people in Mississippi that the Constitution is a, quote, living document. That is the desire and intention of every progressive extremist in American history. Uh, It's a very biased interpretation of American constitutional history, and it really matters. We don't don't get back to the point of the, we talk about it, is is, uh, America races from uh, is our founding. And I have to ask sometimes, so what? So what? What if it was back then? We had slavery back then. We've corrected those. There are many things that we did. Go back to every country. I don't The founding of, um, of, of, of any country in, in Great Britain, it doesn't really matter where it if, is. If every, every country. We have to live today yeah. by the, we have to suffer the sins of our fathers back in those days. It's crazy. 1776. In the past, 
slavery and exploitation were a common factor in every country and yes. every culture. What is unique about the United States is the way in which the founding principles eventually led to overcoming yeah. that human condition. I mean, the other thing, too, and we'll get uh, more into this one, and I don't think people think about this. We are, we are unique. And if there is racism, you would probably find it in no other place better, hang on, than the United States of America at its inception because we started with a clean, uh, a, a blank page as far as immigrants are concerned with only Native Americans here on this indigenous day. And then we brought people from all over the world into it of different nationalities. Take any other land that hasn't been settled and you bring Arabs and Jews and French and Germans together uh, without the Constitution and see what you would have today. Two, three hundred years later. So, it's the person I see in the studio. It is Douglas Carswell. Douglas is president and CEO of Mississippi Center for Public Policy. We're talking about the CRT. This, this is out now for the public. Is it on the website? That's right. We published it's it. It's called Combating Critical Race Theory in Mississippi. Tell me a little bit about the overall findings of this. We found that critical race theory is being promoted. It's being promoted in public schools, but it's most egregiously being advocated in public universities. And what we find so objectionable is not so much that critical race theory is being taught in universities, but there's no balance. There's no countervailing arguments against what's being taught. And I think it's quite worrying. Young people should go to university to broaden their mind, to hear different ideas, to hear competing ideas. But if they're only hearing from critical race theorists, we are going to create a generation of yep. youngsters who hate their own country. Now, I have a theory, and, and um, I, I, I talked about this, it's been quite a while ago, but I think one of the reasons this is so important for the left to do this is baby boomers are the last to really experience pure discrimination. Water fountains in America back in the early days going through the civil rights period. Those baby boomers are fading out. They're, you know, the, 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 the next generation, the generations coming in, they didn't have that. You cannot drink from this fountain. You cannot eat at this restaurant. We have, we have progressed way beyond there. We went through affirmative actions and everything else. It was a struggle. But if you are someone of my age or your age and you're an African-American, you still understand that. You have that feeling. You know what that discrimination, the sting of that feels like. But sooner or later, that's going to be gone. It's almost like the, the hatred from the Civil War. That fades on with the soldiers fade away. So you have to have something to keep that hate up. And I, that's, that's what I sincerely believe, that that's what CRT is. Let us teach racism. Let us show people and continue that hate between the races. And if it's not... That's what it achieves. As an outsider looking at America, I think America should celebrate the extraordinary progress that has been made over the past. Yeah, I agree with you. You can't years. do that, though, because if you do that, racism doesn't hold the power that the left needs. But if you re-racialize American society, you're going to tear the republic apart. You're going to divide yeah, and the when country. you do that, the Democrats win. And you delegitimize the state. This is, this is what this agenda is ultimately about. It's about delegitimizing the very idea of America. Did you see the, uh, all three universities, Mississippi State University of Mississippi and the University of Southern Mississippi, those three, were those the only ones you looked at? No, we looked at a number, but those were more explicit. That could be simply because the content of their websites um, we're not saying it's not being taught elsewhere, but those mm. are the three most egregious examples we could find. Is, um, is, is that a required curriculum for them? No, but we did find at one university that students were required to take courses um, provided by an organization called Everfee. Mm -hmm. And these were mandatory courses. They were online courses because I assume because of the COVID uh, restrictions. And the content of a lot of those courses was very concerning. It, it, it was very one-sided and it taught as accepted wisdom points of view that I would say were highly extremist. So I, I, I think it would be too much to say that there are mandatory courses that are teaching critical race theory, yeah. but there's certainly courses that are teaching critical race theory, and there's not a balance. I, I think if you look at the state constitution, the IHL, the body that oversees the universities, has a duty to ensure that there is 
a range of ideas being taught to young people. Mm -hmm. And I think our report clearly shows that there is not that fair and balanced approach to education. There is a clear bias in favor of some extremist progressive ideas. I don't think parents will understand this even at, uh, from elementary school into, into uh, uh, middle school and certainly in high school unless they know what's going on. They've got to, they've got to know what's going on. They've got to at least do a little bit of a review of the, the classwork or, or the, uh, the, the, the books. Uh, the computer, whatever it happens to be, but they've got to be more informed. For, for a long time now, university administrators have simply said, we're not teaching critical race mm -hmm. theory. We, we don't do this. I hope people will be able to look at this report and and perhaps hand the university administrators a copy of the report and say, you say you're not teaching it, so, so why do you have courses that teach about whiteness? Why do you have courses that explicitly promote these divisive and dangerous ideas? I, I hope that this gives parents and, and students a means to actually hold to account education officials who have denied promoting critical race theory but clearly do. It is interesting that the, a lot of the feedback coming or the pushback coming is from African Americans. They don't like this. And uh, I saw a survey several weeks ago that said the, one of the greatest, the fastest raising percentage of interracial marriages is in the state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because we have such a low amount, but it is now one of the fastest number of marriages as far as interracial marriages. So if you have a, a, a mom and dad of mixed marriage in the state of Mississippi, and this is being taught, I mean, that's, that's a little bit of a conundrum. Mm. I, I was looking at some figures out looking at attitudes over the past 50 years towards interracial relationships, mm -hmm. and there's been extraordinary progress. It's gone from being a, 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 a status that many people disapproved of socially to one where most people are just completely at ease and relaxed with it. Yeah. These are things we should be celebrating. Uh, I, I did, would have preferred that Mr. Carswell be here himself to... Ex, you know, extrapolate from, from how he has redefined critical race theory. But that said, Dr. Luckett, I leave it to you, sir, to respond to whatever points you care uh, to respond to. And with the time remaining, um, we will open it for the audience for comments and or questions. Dr. Luckett. Where do I, we you begin? Know, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I, um, I just want to... Yes. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, who, who are you, sir? Uh, my name is Louis Hindi, I'm a journalist. I, I write for a living about these matters. Um, and I, I just, because he couldn't make it, some conservative should have. You couldn't find one person at this austere university that could have taken the position or at least defended parts of the position so we could actually have a rational, open dialogue. Well. Well, 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 sir, I'm glad to know that you are here, and perhaps you could be part of the dialogue if, 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 you, would like to do, if you would like to do so. Uh, but first, let me carry on with um, the, the program, and I'll be, be right back to you. Yes. So, um, I, and I know we've got a, a lot of people who want to join in and, and be part of this conversation. Um, there's a lot of things that are deeply problematic about what was said. Uh, and, and, and one point up front I want to make Boy, this, this conversation makes this nation seem really fragile. If an intellectual conversation, if an academic concept like critical race theory is so dangerous that it threatens the freedom of this nation, uh, to me, Vladimir Putin is a bigger threat to the future and freedom of this nation than than, than a, 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 an intellectual dialogue around critical race theory. Um, now, I, I do want to say something about critical race theory. I want to back us up. I think maybe many of you in here know uh, that it really has its foundation in Mississippi. Uh, and it begins with the incredible scholar uh, and attorney Derek Bell in many ways when he worked for the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP. 
and he was working on a desegregation lawsuit in Leak County, Mississippi, where there had been for a long time what was called a Rosenwald School. You can learn more about the history of these Rosenwald schools that were, were built um, as resources for black education uh, throughout the South, but there were any number of them ar ar across the state of Mississippi. And so there was a desegregation lawsuit in, in, in Leak County. Uh, Derek Bell was representing the NAACP. And there was some real concern in the black community in Leak County that, well, you know, if we win this desegregation lawsuit, that what's going to happen to our Rosenwald School? What's going to happen to, to the education that's being taught to our children? Uh, and they were, they were deeply concerned. Well, it turns out the NAACP wins. The schools in Leak County have to desegregate. But the community was right. The Rosenwald School essentially disappears. And the resources that were in the Rosenwald School disappeared. And about 10 years later, Derek Bell returned and, and, and was looking at the outcomes of desegregation in Leak County. And he realized that what they thought would be the promise of desegregation really didn't turn out to be so great for the communities uh, there in Leak County. And he wanted to know why. Like, what was the problem? What happened? This is, again, an intellectual pursuit, an intellectual concept, right? And so the, the way he began doing that was through what he would call critical race theory, looking at how race exists in this country, understanding, one, that it is a social construct, something that I'm sure your, your professors are, are teaching uh, here, talking about what race is, understanding that it's not a biological design, but it's something that our society gives meaning to, that is created, that is constructed, but that even though it is created and constructed and is not kind of born in nature, that it has real impacts on our lives. And those impacts can be negative, they can also be positive right? Race doesn't always have to be defined in terms of its negative outcomes. Unfortunately, in Mississippi, race, and particularly blackness, has been used to maintain a system of racialized power um, for, you know, for the better part of 300 years. Um, and so he wanted to examine that, and he wanted to examine how race impacts things like the desegregation of schools in Leake County, Mississippi, right? And, and, and from that came this exploration um, of critical race theory, and, and particularly how it impacts our legal systems, right? Um, and, and how um, we are still dealing with the repercussions of that to this day. As a civil rights historian, that's just history. That's not particularly controversial. Uh, and I certainly don't consider it extremist ideology. Um, nor do I consider progressivism to be extremist either. Um, <laughs> and so I, I think it, it, it really is a, 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 a poor attempt here to use this academic concept and this intellectual endeavor essentially for fear-mongering, to make people afraid. Um, and, 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 and the bill that we have, it doesn't say anything about critical race theory. It, it, uh, boiling it down, it essentially says, we're not allowed to teach someone that you're inferior or superior to someone else. And, and, and inferior or superior are the words that are used in the legislation. I don't know anybody uh, who's doing that. I do know people at our colleges and universities who are teaching about the past in real ways. There's, I, I think, a particularly concerning point here that I would make about what they said about Christopher Columbus. You know, at one point, the conversation is, why are we trying to cancel Christopher Columbus? But then another point is being made in which they say, why do we have to talk about slavery anymore? So what that our uh, founding fathers were slave owners? So we can't talk about Christopher Columbus and the reality of what European imperialism looked like through world history. And at the same time, we can't talk about the founding fathers as slave owners, right? And, 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 and the complexity of that. And as far as I can tell, no one has ever written a rule that says history can't be messy, that history must make us always feel good about ourselves. There's no rule out there that says that the people who came before us had to always be good or right 
They could, in fact, be quite wrong. And we can learn about ourselves. We can learn about this nation and make it better by an honest examination of that past, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I actually think the state of Mississippi has some of the greatest American heroes of, of any state in the nation. My favorite American of all time is a black woman from Holly Springs, Mississippi, Ida B. Wells. Um, and let's look at, at what they did. Medgar Evers, a World War II veteran, denied the right to vote when he went to try and cast his ballot wearing his World War II uniform, right? We have some really, Fannie Lou Hamer, so we could keep going and going. Uh, and, and honest conversation uh, around this past, this history, is one that is good for us. And it's okay for us to be uncomfortable. And it's okay for young people to be uncomfortable too. Um, Vaughn Gordon, when he was talking to, uh, uh, at the legislative breakfast last week, he said, you know what? If your child comes home and there's been a lesson on the history of slavery and they come home and they're uncomfortable about that, maybe it shows that they have a moral compass. Maybe it says something good about them that they're bothered by the history of slavery in America. Uh, and that was one of the things I wrote down that he said that I thought that was right on. Um, and so um, rather than trying to actually cancel the conversation that we're, we're hoping to have around the reality of our past in this country, we should have a more robust one, I believe, and that in that robustness, we can, we can learn about ourselves and our past in ways that positively impact our present and our future. I'm proud to be an American. I, I, I believe I'm teaching my students at Jackson State to love this nation and understand what they can do to make it live up to its ideals. That's my goal. I want them to, to, to make sure that they know that they can impact this world in a way that can make America responsible for what it claims it is uh, in its founding documents. Uh, sir, thank you, Dr. Luckett. If, if you would, uh, you want to stand or, or speak from the seat. Okay. Sure. Oh, oh, uh, could I get your name again, please? Sure. My name is Lee Habib. I'm an essayist for Newsweek. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm sorry. Slow Lee down Habib. your name. Lee Habib. Lee Habib. H-A-B-I-B. -B. Yeah, I'm an essayist for the far right wing publication Newsweek. Okay. Um, and, and I've been writing about these things for a long time to, to, to really not make, well, first of all, this anti-critical race theory bill is a hoax. Right? I agree. But when we read the bill, it's actually a non-bill. The bill itself does nothing. So why are we here? The bill does nothing. The bill does nothing. It stops no teacher from doing anything. And I speak to this as a lifetime public educator, a superintendent of the year, and a teacher of the year in New Jersey, and an Arab who led blockbusting. Because this Arab and half Sicilian got discriminated against. In fact, Sicilians are, are the subject of the largest mass lynching in American history in Louisiana, 11 Sicilians were lynched because they were Catholics and they were very dark skinned. So I know the sting of discrimination. The question is, how is Marxism creeping into our schools through cultural things like anti-racism and white privilege? My daughter, we removed her from the Oxford Public Schools because she's Arab. And she was told that being white meant hard work, personal responsibility, and liking capitalism. She was taught in that school anti-racism, which says you have to be a white traitor and admit that you're a racist even if you don't know it. And I've read Kendi inside and out. This shouldn't be the argument that a lot of conservatives and even a lot of moderates in Virginia objected to was what's going on in our schools. And you don't know, because you know what you don't know and you said it? My dad didn't even know what his own teachers were teaching. So you professing that you know what every teacher in this state is teaching is an abject lie. Let me tell you something else about my dad. As a superintendent for 15 years, he could not fire a teacher, even the ones who are Marxist or radical Christians or ideologues. What I think a lot of conservatives are starting to resent, lots, and I'm a libertarian, is that we are not being represented. We are being, a, a video is getting played, and shame on him for not coming, and thank you for playing the video, Randall. Good for you for doing that. But I think someone should have found one conservative on this campus who would have at least defended what is really going on and what parents are afraid of. Their kids are coming home from school being taught this anti-racist stuff, and it's dangerous. Read Kendi all the way. I love 80% of his book. The history of this country is terrible. We need to make kids uncomfortable about racism. We need to make kids uncomfortable about slavery, 
But we also let them know it, the kind of cultural context of this country's history. We need to let them know what every other country was like in 1776. We have to, right? Because then they might not hate their country as much. They might need to know who led the abolition movement. And it was whites from Michigan and Pennsylvania and Christians. And it was Europeans who ended and abolished slavery. And it was African nations who were the last to abolish slavery. And Middle Eastern nations, and I know a lot about the Middle East, Iran was the last country to abolish slavery. So you're right, it's messy, but ideologues, leftists, and look, you're leftist. William Winter Institute is leftist. Mississippi Today is leftist. Start describing who you are to kids and let them have the left-wing view and the right-wing view and let the kids make up their own mind. I've been here for 15 years and the kids aren't allowed to make up their own mind. The history department, the law school, the last hires in the last 10 years at this university, and I could prove this, from their academic vetoes and who they invite on this campus are overwhelmingly leftist. Now you're right about American history. My dad taught it and he led the charge for civil rights education. We whitewashed American history straight up till 1980. But we better not whitewash it the other way around, throw capitalism under the bus completely and make capitalism be white and a system of oppression. It freed, capitalism has freed more people from poverty, freed this Lebanese American. And so I think these are the things that we have to talk about. This is why so many people are upset and I hate that there was an attack on critical race theory. People think white supremacy and anti-racism and white privilege is critical race theory. Critical race theory is totally different. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, th th thank you, Mr. Habib. Um, floor is open to anyone else who cares to comment or read I, I, yeah. do, I do want to say two things real quick. I'm sorry. I just, one, I, I don't think I lied about anything. Um, I, he asked me if I... He asked me if I was aware. I, he asked me if I was aware of anyone teaching it. I don't. Um, I, I I'm not aware of anyone who is teaching it. There, I I don't. I I've, I've never heard anyone teach it. So. But the, the, the other point I want to make about why we should be concerned about this bill, one, in the clip here, you clearly heard um, what was a very political attack. They actually used the word Democrats, right, to attack critical race theory. It was a politicized attack. But what I think we should be worried about in this bill um, that is, is surely going to be signed by the governor is, is not what it what it explicitly prevents because it, it, it really it doesn't say anything about critical race theory it's not going to stop what I teach uh, and I would welcome you to talk to my students I think I got a pretty good reputation on the campus of Jackson State University and the study that was here by the way did not look at any of our HBCUs uh, in Mississippi and the work that's happening there um, but I'll tell you why I think we should be concerned about the bill because what I think the potential is is that it's going to be used as a tool of intimidation to keep our teachers, kindergarten through 12th grade, I'm not worried about the great scholars that are at this university and that are at other institutions of higher learning in Mississippi. I think that we're gonna be able to hold our own. But, but the, 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 the elementary and secondary teachers who are going to hear about this bill and who are going to get intense pushback from parents who think they know what the bill is based on this kind of dialogue. And I'm afraid it's going to circumscribe the type of conversations I'm talking about that I think we need to have. And, and, and I think that's maybe perhaps its real intention is, is as a tool of intimidation and, and fear mongering, even if it doesn't explicitly cancel critical race theory. That would be why I think we need to talk about it and why we should be concerned about the legislation. I'm yes, ma'am. That's a, that's a question. I saw a reference to a budget of 700000 a year, but I have no idea. Uh, they also take donations from the public. And another question. Would Mr. Carswell approve of kids making a pilgrimage to Montgomery to see the, the uh, Ron Stevenson's Equal Rights Initiative? Equal Justice Initiative. African Americans were uh, memorialized because they were lynched. Is that off limits? I, mean, I, can't, I can't answer that. Limits. I can tell you, if you look at the research the Equal Justice Initiative has done, that Mississippi led the nation in the total number of known lynchings between 1877 no. and 1950. That's 654. If you do the math, that's a known lynching every six weeks for 73 years in the history of Mississippi. And there are people in this room right now who definitely remember 1950, right? 
Uh, and a part of the Equal Justice Initiative's definition of a lynching, part of it includes that the people who commit the murder get away with it. There's never any justice. Right. So we know that for 73 years, every six weeks, someone was murdered. We but know who was murdered, who murdered them, and that they got away with and it. And the grandson of the one from Oxford was present in the African-American church when we had that ceremony to honor. And they brought the dirt from Oxford where he was lynched. And it seems like that would be off limits because that's teaching something bad happened. And I think if anyone goes there, they will just be, it's, uh, I, think, I think Brian Stevenson will be the next N Nelson Mandela. I, I, I would say you don't even have to go to Alabama. <laughs> you can go ar around the state of Mississippi. May, may we get your name, please? Uh, Wilson? Wilson? No, Wilkie. Wilkie. Wil oh, Curtis? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so let's, try, <laughs> let's try to get uh, uh, several questions in. Short questions, short answers. Okay, sorry. Anybody? Up here. Hi, uh, I'm a law student at Vanderbilt, and I would just like to say that um, I think it is a blessing that um, as a student in Nashville, um, I am allowed to learn about the critical race theory. And I think this is a fundamental right that all law students should be prepared for um, in uh, practice. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I'm not supposed to be here. Um, <laughs> but I, I do come from DeSoto County. I am a I am a, a, an alumni of Mississippi education um, in the public sector, and I did work for the Board of Education in Mississippi, and I will say that um, the Board of Education is attempting to make um, the best efforts to include the critical race theory in our education. I think it is important that we do strike a balance between this conversation around white savior and anti-racism, uh, and also communicating that racism is still um, very well uh, systematically endowed into uh, our current curriculum, um, I think there's just a balance to be struck, and I think uh, by striking on this bill, if um, the governor does do so, um, it will set a precedent where um, the conversation around critical race theory will be silenced in Mississippi. Then, now that is not to say that uh, teachers are not allowed to talk about it or are allowed to talk about it. I just think that there should be some um, conversation in the classroom that is directed towards critical race theory, um, especially as a as a student of law. Um, it concerns greatly um, the, the practice of law, the practice of medicine, how that bleeds into uh, further, further education in our system. Thank next, you. Next Thank question. You for that. Next question. Somebody, did I see somebody up there? Hand, hand up. No? Okay. Huh. Um, let, let me just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. B, you said New Jersey. Where in New Jersey? Uh, Where in Bergen County? Uh, TNEC. I, 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 I live in Teaneck. I'm very familiar. Okay, so um, l let me and thank you for um, sharing your thoughts on this and thank you all for coming here. Um, you told me a few minutes over. We're many more than a few minutes over. But final, I just feel moved to t t say this. My mother, who is still alive, thank God, um, was a re school teacher in Yazoo County for 40 odd years. At one point in her career, she had to sign a contract that indicated that she was not a member of the NAACP. And if it had been discovered that she was, she would be fired. And if she refused to sign the contract, she wouldn't be hired. That's thing number one. And that was not 1776 or 1890 or 1935. It was in my lifetime. Thing number two. One of my history teachers, Ms. Ruth Shirley, at Lanier High School, 10th grade history teacher, told me that she went off the curriculum and a student of hers told her mom, and her mom said, oh, you're not supposed to be talking about that. And that got to the principal, and the principal squashed it before it got to the superintendent, because if it had gotten to the superintendent, white superintendent, Kirby Walker, Ms. Shirley would have been fired, period. So this thing about race being part and parcel of life in Mississippi, I can attest to it having lived here, and I can attest to it still reading about it. And if someone says talking about race is a bad thing, I just think they're not thinking squarely. And, and if they know what they're doing, then obviously it's for other purposes, political dissension. 
Okay. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Overby, for allowing thank us you. to have this discussion.